Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the Fam Vester podcast. We're going to be talking about backpacking through Europe with a baby. My name is Sunny Burns, and I'll be your host. And I am your co-host, Sun Marie Burns. So we took this trip nearly four years ago now in October of 2015. We backpacked through five countries. We did it in three weeks' time. And again, we didn't take anything but carry-on. Just two backpacks, one baby carrier, and one six-month-old. And, you know, we traveled to the UK, France, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and just had a really wonderful, great time. And, you know, having just become new parents, everyone was telling us you can't you know, once you become parents, your your traveling is limited, and to, for a, a large degree, that's true. But we really didn't want to cut off that part of our lives because we loved it so much. Right, we love traveling. It's been a major part of our life since the get go, and uh, we knew we wanted our kids and our family, and we wanted to continue to enjoy traveling with them. So we didn't let that stop us, and we found a few clever tricks along the way to make the experience a little more enjoyable and easier for both parents and kids. So we're going to share that today. Right. And we have other family tips that we've kind of learned along the next four years, you know, the past four years of traveling, because we've done a lot of traveling since then as well. And yeah, we're excited to share all those tips with you. So we're going to get into it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a good show. So let's uh, roll the introduction and we'll get right into it. You're listening to the FamVestor Podcast. If you're looking to raise your family with intention, gain financial independence, and live a life of true freedom, you're in the right place. Join us as we explore together how to create thriving families, because strong families are the cornerstone for a world at peace. Welcome back. Feel free to follow along as we go through this podcast on our post at fanvestor.com slash backpacking, where we detail all the points we're discussing in today's episode. Um, But to get right into it, traveling with kids can be a lot of fun. There's just a few things you need to do ahead of time to ensure the best possible travel time for you and your kids. First thing being, adjusting your expectations accordingly. Traveling with kids is definitely different than traveling with uh, friends or alone. Um, or just an adult party, um, there's a few things that you do need to adjust in your expectations. And we figured out three main ones. First one being, um, don't expect to sit down at fancy restaurants. It's not worth it with little kids. You're going to have the tantrums, the meltdowns, the, the impatience for waiting for food. So just eat more on the go. We find that there's a lot less stress and a lot more enjoyable. Um, second, strategically schedule your travel around nap time and rest times for the kids so that they can relax and not get overtired throughout the day so everyone's enjoying themselves. And lastly, forgo the nightlife. It's not worth it. Your kids need to get a good night's sleep so that you can all enjoy the next day. So those are our three main tips on on adjustments you have to make when traveling with kids. But if you could do that, it could be really enjoyable. We're going to jump right into how we did it. And we're actually very minimalist travelers. So we're not advocates for bringing tons and tons of luggage with you. It weighs you down, it holds you back, and it limits what you're able to do. So we're going to share our story of how we went three weeks through Europe just with backpacks. And with that, our baby. And that's to five countries. We were in the United Kingdom. We went to France, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, um, and just had a wonderful time, you know, just uh, 19 days of continuous travel and exploring exploring the uh, European continent. So this was a very strategic tip uh, pl- um, trip for us. You know, we did have the six-month-old we had to take care of. You know, he needs diapers baby wipes and things like that and we you know we wanted to really have the backpacking europe experience um so we had to do this very cleverly so what what did we do you know i did a lot of research and i knew that we needed to get wool clothing or synthetic clothing things that dry quickly don't smell so so bad and um easily washable easily washable and that you can use over and over again because we were washing clothes almost every night um, at home or on at, trip. On, on the on the on the go, you know, mm-hmm. we would stop and we would just wash it in the sink. Um, if you go to the website, the blog post, you'll see all the things that we brought. 
you know, I had a 50 liter hiking bag that we filled most of the stuff with. And then Sunmi, you pretty much just carried the camel back Which with a water, water pouch. Supply. Right. So and we had a few a, essentials. Pretty much a gallon of water with us at all times. Mm-hmm. And and the baby carrier. You mostly carried the baby as well as that um, little water camel back. Right. So so how did we do it? What did we determine was essential? To bring with us and what do we decide to leave behind right we only brought one pair of pants each we did have long johns because it's october so you know in the alps it's cold um and you know we brought a lot of underwear a lot of socks and a lot of underlayments but a very few sweaters jackets uh, and the jackets we did bring were very compressible so again lots of thought was put into that we also didn't bring 500 diapers we only brought you know 20 diapers to last us the first couple days and then refueled along the way right cuz diapers are something that you need to have but they're something that you can find universally anywhere in the world so there's no need to pack a full supply of diapers from home you could pick them up on the go uh, we we've, we've chose compressible clothing over bulky clothing to make it less bulky. So we each had a merino wool sweater, one. We had one pair of pants. We had one ultralight down jacket that compressed um, and some thermal layers, right. synthetic thermal layers. And that was basically it right. as and far so- as clothing went. So it was compressible, like wool and synthetics, but also very warm for the amount of space it took, too. Right. Over cotton, especially. Yeah. Which was essential since we were in Europe in the fall and weather could be quite cool in the mountains there. So we needed to to plan accordingly. As for the baby, we packed about four or five onesie zip-up suits with the little feet covering so that he he was covered head to toe and we packed one extra warm um onesie that that served as a a coat basically with a hood and those were his main items of clothing during travel and and keep in mind i was wearing him in the baby carrier for 90 percent of the trip therefore the baby carrier served as yet another layer of uh warmth for the baby Right. And then every night, wherever we stayed, we'd um, clog up the sink, pull up the little stopper there, put in our used clothes, any underwear that we had worn that day. And then we carried around with us actually this wool laundress soap and poured it in, washed it, hand washed it, and then set it out to dry that night. And then by morning it was dry because wool uh, dries very quickly. So do synthetics. So that was another reason for the wool and the synthetics. Right. Just clean it. And then after one night, it's dry and ready to wear the next morning. And everyone has a sink you where you stay. So it was very easy to do. Right. Um, as far as other essentials, you know, toiletries, nursing cover. Our, our little guy was still six months old and we weren't formula feeding him. So that actually kept things a lot simpler for our traveling too. Um, and I just brought a cover, which didn't take up a lot of space either. Um, right. So we didn't have to worry about carrying out formula, refrigerating mm-hmm. it. It was um, simple to uh, feed him and keep going. Right. Um, once you have a child who's eating age and he's having snacks and foods, maybe it's a little more complicated. You want to always have a snack on hand. But again, wherever you travel, there's going to be food right. and there's going to be baby foods of the same brand that you find here in America. So you're going to be able to pick them up wherever you go. Right. And a lot of times you got to think about, I I mean, so originally when we planned this trip, we were thinking of going on all the train lines and doing it true backpacking style. Unfortunately, this was right around the time where um, there was refugees all over the European train system, the Syrian refugees. And we, you know, with a six month old, we didn't think it was the most prudent option. So we ended up opting to rent a car once we left the UK, went to Paris. And in Paris, in Paris, was it Paris or was it Austria. Anyway, I think we in Paris, we picked up a, a rental car and yeah. instead of paying for the car seat, because so often car seats are so expensive with the rental cars, you know, you're almost paying as much as, especially with two kids now, I feel like we pay as much just to rent the, the car, car seat seats. As your daily rental fee. As your daily rental fee. And so we went on the European Craigslist and we just bought like a $20 used car seat and took that along with us. And because we did a one-way rental car trip it would have cost us even more to return that car seat to the original destination Mm. so we like we started in france and we ended in austria 
Right. It was kind of an unconventional, creative way to get around that car seat fee. Um, but it worked for us. You know, we were able to, to find one successfully at a low price. And, and we donated it to the local church after being done with it right. there in Austria. Hopefully someone can use it. <laughs> right. And a lot of people like wonder, and this was our main concern, was how is our, you know, six month old going to behave during this whole three week trip? Is, is he going to be like a tantruming monster? Um, and this was, you know, a gamble that we took. <laughs> Um, taking him on but honestly we both feel like he was such a delight during this whole trip right. um, and we think because you know he was just taking in all the sights you know he was constantly facing outwards in our front facing carrier and he was with us all day long seeing new and exciting things he'd never experienced before so he actually seemed to thrive on the travel experience and we took plenty of stretch breaks where we could take him out of the car carrier he could crawl around and move around a bit that's definitely important not to overpack your day when you're traveling right. to really take it you know have a loose plan of what you want to get done but make sure there's enough flexibility in there to work around your children when they get tired or antsy and need a break that's that's key to have uh not too many expectations for your day but we we did a lot and i think uh he really enjoyed it and also i do feel you know um starting traveling young with kids mm -hmm. The sooner you do it, the sooner they're going to get used to traveling, and it's just going to become a way of life for them. And then it'll just get easier with every single trip you continue to take in the future because they're more and more accustomed to traveling. Right. That's definitely been the case for us. Yeah, our kids love traveling. They still talk about, like, we took this, when Valen was two years old, he took this trip to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and he just, like, loved that trip so much. <laughs> and every every week he brings up Pigeon Forge. I want to go back to Pigeon Forge. He's four now, so two years later, he's still bringing up this trip. And, you know, people always tell us kids never remember anything, but he, he loved that trip. Right. He loved the Taco Bell at Pigeon Forge. That was right. his highlight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we actually, interesting fact, we started traveling with Valen, our oldest, when he was, I believe, three months old. We took him on our first camping trip. Right. Yeah, right? to Assateague Island in Maryland. And it was the summer and it was warm and it was just a weekend getaway. But it was a good way for us to get our feet in the water to experience travel with a little one. And I think that was invaluable. You know, we didn't jump first from... No travel right. straight into a three week backpacking excursion in Europe. We'd done several small local weekend trips leading up to that larger trip. And I think that is key for success also that you prime your kids for travel on smaller, more manageable journeys first. Right. And we had, you know, we we're a very active family. So we had done hikes with the carrier, so extended hikes. You know, he's used to walking with us. Um, without a stroller or a need for any of that. so The more you do with them, the more you take them out, the more they get exposed to travel and outings and excursions, the better travelers they become, Right. naturally. Yeah, we took this crazy trip um, when we had our second son, and he was just around six, six months, months old, yeah. um, and our eldest was two, and we took a trip to California. Then from California, we went to Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage, Alaska. And from Anchorage, Alaska, we went to Kodiak Island in Alaska and then back to back home to New Jersey. So it was like seven flights in the span of I think it was about two a three weeks, weeks, three weeks, three weeks something week like that. in California, two weeks in Alaska. And yeah, it was just a crazy trip. And honestly, that was a bit draining, um, all those flights in such a short time period. But, but honestly, it wasn't they the kids really, that were it draining. Wasn't. It, it was, was just the, the travel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, to go into a little bit of the financing, and we kind of talk a lot about travel hacking in episode two of the Fanvestor podcast. So if you want more details, you can find out there. But we paid for this European flight using American Advantage miles that we got from opening up a city American Advantage card. So I think it was 40,000 miles round trip for each of us to go to Europe and back. There was a bit of fees this time around. I forget why, but Europe charged like $200 in fees for both of us to go. Uh, Valen was free, uh, luckily. He uh, was actually, under no, we did have to pay. Actually, international mm. flights for two years old and under, you have to pay 10% for international. Domestic is free for two years old and under, but international, you do have to pay a 10% fee. So I think we ended up paying like $200 for him too. Um, because, yeah, that was 10% of the international flight costs at the time of booking, I think. Right. But still, you're coming in at way less than than typically when you're using mileage. And that's another 
concern families have is, oh, you know, traveling with kids is so expensive. Well, it doesn't have to be. There's clever ways to get around it. You know, you use miles. You have kids who are under two. They get to travel for free. Um, and so you just travel using those those strategies. Right. And if you get them used to it now, then you don't have to, you know, they get used to it. And it's free for you because they're under two. And it's just... It's a, it's a good way to prime yourself for future adventures. Right. So on this three-week trip, we only spent $2,400 total, you know, and a lot of that uh, was because we didn't do a lot of, the, you know, the extravagant tourist traps, and we stayed with a lot of family and friends. We actually only ended up spending one night uh, lodging, and that was in the UK right when we arrived. But other than that, it was all, you know, you have relatives in Europe. So we were able to plan accordingly and you had friends. So we were able to plan accordingly to stay with these friends and family. And they had never seen our baby. So they were excited to welcome us in. And it was, you know, a great trip that meant more than just vacationing. It was like a reunion for us. Right. And I think that's a big tip too when you're traveling. Really look to your um friend and family network if you don't have family in the place you're traveling to perhaps you have a friend who knows someone who lives there or has family there Mm -hmm. and people love having visitors coming by they love hosting and sharing their country with you um so it's a really wonderful way to have a personal personal experience and be immersed in the local culture um, where you're saving money you're staying at someone's home where you have that personal touch and you're getting really the the essential experience. Right, and they there. can direct you the best local things to do. Right. And, of course, make it a shared good win-win experience for all parties. We would treat a lot for dinners. We would leave gifts and, yeah, just made it a nice experience all around. So now we want to go into some other family traveling tips we've kind of learned along the way. Now having two kids and having traveled extensively, um, I think our eldest son has been to 13 13 countries at this point and many, many states. Um, He's been on two cruises. So we've done a lot of traveling with him. So we want to share some of our experience, some of our best uh, travel hacks that we've discovered. Um, So yeah, we want to talk about how, you know, we did cruising for cheap less than $250 a person for a Royal Caribbean five-day cruise from Puerto Rico, and how we've kind of started doing a lot of intergenerational traveling, so inviting our or their grandparents along, so making a three-generation vacationing trip and doing that through um, some great vacation clubs as well as Airbnb stays, and how we try to book things with full kitchens now to kind of save on meal costs. Right. And, um, yeah, especially when you have a huge group like that, um, you know, we can take turns cooking meals and it's healthier, it's cheaper, and it just it seems to work out very well. So we want to go into those details. Um, yeah. Right. So I guess the first um, tip we wanted to share about is the AFV club which is the Armed Forces Vacation Club. And we've used this quite a bit now. Uh, I think we've stayed at six different places. And it is a bit selective. You do have to be uh, a military member or a family of a military member. So anyone that's active duty, guard, reserve, retired U.S. military, and civilian employees of the Department of Defense. But also their direct family, so spouses, parents, and children of any of those that are eligible, you can then be eligible too. If your dad is a retired vet, you can be eligible for the Armed Forces Vacations Club. If your son is active duty, then you can be eligible as well. Right, and it gives you access to like 200,000 resort accommodations worldwide. It's like Wyndham's excess inventory. So you're not going to get like peak times uh, in like the best places in the world. But you are going to get, you know, we just uh, a month ago, we were in the Outer Banks in North Carolina, had a wonderful time. Great three bedrooms, two bedroom, three bedroom stay there. And, you know, it worked out to be like twenty seven dollars a night because it was there was a great buy one week, get one week uh, free. So we're going to be staying in December in Florida this coming December. Also a three bedroom stay with a water park. So at like $27 a night with three bedrooms, you know, we're gonna, we had uh, my dad, her parents there with us. And we're going to have both families there with us in December when we drive down to Florida. Right. And these units are basically small condos, which is a big plus over going to your typical 
hotel motel situation. So you're going to have a kitchen, a living room with a television, you're going to have the bedrooms, and you're going to have a all informal the plates dining area. and utensils supplied as well. So cooking is very easy. We just go to the local uh, supermarket, buy the groceries. And what we like to do actually is um, tell every all the um, people who are coming with us, you know, what we're going to do is everyone puts in $100 at the beginning of the week, and that's going to cover all the cook, the grocery shopping and all the meals and restaurants we might go to. We'll do a shared uh, shared bill and also any outings we do as a shared group will come from this collective budget that's created from that hundred dollars everyone puts right in. and it makes it very affordable for everyone traveling grandparents right. and siblings and family members um, to set out with that budget in the beginning and then you can choose during your travels as a group if you want to splurge beyond it or you can just keep with it and it it's worked out very well for our families Right. And we've stayed in places like New Hampshire, Tennessee, uh, Florida a couple times now. And um, New, did I say New Hampshire? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's been great. And I feel like once the kids kind of got older past that two year old mark, we did start uh, turning down a little bit the international travel and increasing the domestic travel just because it was easier, uh, especially, you know, we. We drove down all the way to Florida. Our tip there is to leave late at night and drive through the night. You know, we would take turns. If you, and If you can handle keeping yourself up for an all-nighter driving. Right. I would drive half the night. It's nice because the kids Sunday are sleeping and you have peace. <laughs> right. I would drive half the night. You would sleep. Then you would take a turn. I would sleep. And we, would, uh, we had friends in South Carolina, so we'd take a break there and then continue the journey the next night. Um, but yeah, having that peace and it, how, are we there yet for 17 hours is a little bit or much. Or just, I so want to get out. <laughs> we, we felt, we felt it was worth it to do that late night, leave at 10 PM and get going. Right. We did the same thing when we went to the Outer Banks, that eight hour drive. We left at, um, like 6 PM or something like that. Right. So those are our tips there. So that's the AFV Club. Definitely check it out. But you can do the same thing, and we've done it with Airbnbs. So we'll get, you know, instead of like a one-bedroom Airbnb, we'll get a two- or three-bedroom with a full kitchen and stay with the relatives. Um, and that, you know, again, we're taking care of, we're taking those same advantages of, you know, Using having a collective food budget, going for groceries, and just, you know, saving um, just by, you know, more adults paying and more adults staying. You can get grander places or bigger places for a more affordable costs rather than all these separate rooms. Right. And especially when you're traveling with kids, you may think, oh, well, doing all the cooking at home, that's no fun. That's not why I go on vacation. But truthfully... Eating in a restaurant with a large group and rowdy kids is not really a vacation either. So we have found that having a communal meal in the comfort of our stay away home was really enjoyable. Good bonding time and totally stress free. Right. We didn't have to worry about people giving us funny looks. And I think <laughs> it's kind of fun, you know, cooking for a huge group. You know, we can every person takes a turn and they put their own collective uh, cool spin on what dish they want to serve for everyone. So I don't know. I personally enjoy it, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of us enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, if you want more details on AFV Club, go to fanvestor.com slash AFV Club. I do have a very detailed post on how it works and how you might be eligible for it. Cruising? So uh, we want to touch on cruising. I don't have a post on this, so this is a specific pod podcast exclusive tip on <laughs> cruising. Um, so the first cruise we went on, uh, I had always wanted to try cruising. I'd never done it. So the first one we went on was two years ago now. Mm -hmm. And it was from, and so I used a site called cruisesheet.com and that's one I would recommend. And what I would recommend is, uh, just setting up an, a weekly email alert for the cheapest cruises from your closest port of call. So for us in the New York city area, that's in Bayonne, New Jersey, Northern New Jersey. And so I set up an alert, give me any cheap cruises from Bayonne, New Jersey. That way I don't have to pay for a plane ticket to get to the cruise location. I can just drive there and we can take the cruise ship from there, save travel costs by not having to drive to a, a faraway port. Right. So that that's generally how we set our searches. Right. But we sometimes also include um, returning destination, our local port as well. So maybe... The cruise starts a one somewhere cruise. internationally and cruises one way back to Bayonne, New Jersey. That still works for us. That way we only have to pay 
one way to get to the starting point and then we cruise back home. Right. And that's how we found our first cruise for cheap. It took like six months to find a really good deal. And this I got emailed this really good deal. It was a rerouting. So sometimes cruise cruise lines will reroute their ships. So this, this ship was no longer going to be traveling from Puerto Rico to New Jersey. And they were rerouting it to this New Jersey area to leave from. So because it was a one-way trip, it's inconvenient. They lowered the price. And they lowered it to $250 a person uh, for a five-day Royal Caribbean trip. Right. You know, and that's, you know, full meals included. Everything is included, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to pay for extras if you want things like alcohol or Wi-Fi or soda. And you, you can dine in the expensive restaurants, but why? The food there is great, the, the included food. Yeah, the buffets on the boat. Right. So we kept it cheap by, you know, only drinking the water. And, you know, we even brought a camel back just so we had the water pouch everywhere we went and we wouldn't have to pay for sodas along the way or anything like that. So that's one tip. Uh, we even brought a Tupperware container. Uh, that's another tip to uh, bring the cruise line food with us on any excursions we might take off the ship. So rather than having to buy on site, uh, on location, we had the cruise food with us and we just snacked on that when, while we were on the road off the cruise ship. Right. And that generally works. It worked for us on our cruise from Puerto Rico. We we had one stop in San Martin and we enjoyed the day there. They allowed us to take food off the boat in San Martin. Nobody questioned that. Um, we did experience on a, on a later cruise where we cruised to Bermuda that they did confiscate all the food as you were getting off the boat because oh, that was right. the yeah. Bermuda government didn't want you bringing your own food onto the island. I guess they want you to support the local island. Or I vendors. think there was more concern about uh, contamination or bringing in invasive species Fruit or things stuff. like that. So they may do that when you're getting off the boat. I but it's definitely nice to have snacks around when you're, you know, you got little kids with you and they, they get hungry at random times and it may not be mealtime. <laughs> right. So also uh, a huge tip we found from another co-cruise trip traveler was gratuity. So gratuity is usually automatic on cruise lines and Royal Caribbean charges like $14 a day. And that adds up, especially a family of four, uh, $14 a day, that's $60 a night, five nights, that's 300 bucks. Uh, it adds up really quickly. So you can actually and uh, talk to the customer service uh, while you're on the cruise ship and say, I would like to take off automatic gratuity. And that's what we did for our two-year-old uh, two and zero-year-old because we just we didn't feel right about get them getting charged full gratuity at an adult rate uh, just like everyone else. And, you know, we took some of that savings gratuity and uh, give gave a hefty tip to our room keeper directly room keeper and, and our, our waiter, waiter and things like that. Right. So, But that was just a great tip we found uh, from a fellow cruiser. That it doesn't have to be mandatory. You can ask to have it removed, and then you can give it out at your discretion to your team members who really made a difference in your stay. Right. And we found that to be really helpful. Right. So I think that pretty much wraps up the majority of our family travel tips. Uh, one last tip I would like to share, one that I really like, I think a lot of people won't necessarily be able to adhere to, is but just eating out at buffets while you're traveling. I think it's a great way to save money and get, you know, especially if you go to a quality buffet, like I love Indian buffets or sushi buffets. But, and yes, they are expensive, maybe like $15, $20 for a lunch buffet. But what I do is I don't eat much breakfast. And if I, the way I eat at lunch, if I max out on my buffet, then I don't have to eat dinner. So essentially you get three meals for the price of one buffet, which is usually around $15 for a lunch buffet. So I think it's a great way to keep food costs low while you're traveling if you don't have access to a uh, kitchen or things like that. Right. It, it is definitely helpful. And usually when we go to a lunch buffet, we'll go towards the end of the lunch buffet. So that's later in the afternoon so that it after you've eaten, it does carry through through dinner time, and you just have a light snack in the evening, or right. maybe nothing, just a dessert or something. If you don't yeah. need a meal, but lunch buffets are cheaper than dinner as well, and it's closer to breakfast, so you can make that stretch. <laughs> yeah. Just one quick tip that I think is actually quite clever. Yes. So just a couple more tips to add to ease the long journeys traveling with kids. We found these tips extra helpful. First thing. The Melissa and Doug Water Wow Pen 
set. When I gave this first to my son, we were returning home from a road trip from Tennessee, and I gave it to him in the car, hoping it would appease him because we were driving during the day. And he spent literally eight hours straight doing this over and over again. He had so much fun with it. And it's almost no mess. Right. It's no mess. And how it works is they include this little pen. It's called a water pen. And you fill it with water. And then they can draw on the picture with their pen. And as they draw, colors start to appear. I don't know if we can see it here. Um, but they're slowly coming together. Um, and yeah, it just it's just a really nice way for them to keep themselves entertained. There's multiple pages per pad and right. multiple types of pads. So we have like five or ten of these now. They have some that are more geared for girls, some for boys, some that are just completely neutral. Here's one on animals. Right. And they're and like five dollars. They're like five dollars. They dry out so they're reusable. As soon as the page dries again, it goes back to being black white. and white yep. and you can go over it with the water pen and color it again especially for small children who don't have good drawing skills my son didn't enjoy using crayons and coloring pages so coloring books weren't useful but this came in really handy because he felt super proud of being able to draw a beautiful picture just by using the water pen so i highly recommend those for plane rides long car rides whatever it might be they've come in super handy for us we've bought every single one that they've made so far I hope they come out with more. <laughs> new toys. Um, next tip we have is buying a small supply of new toys that you keep hidden from your kids until you're traveling. And then you pull them out strategically throughout your trip, especially on a long airplane ride. For instance, if you're going to Europe and you're having like a five or six hour airplane ride, you can have a little bag full of matchbox cars that you take out and you give him a new car or two every hour. And that resets his his uh, interest in what he has in front of him, and then it makes the trip more bearable. He gets to play with these cars for two hours and enjoys them, or for one hour, and then when he gets tired of them, you whip out another one. You know, and with us having boys, cars were the best thing, but little puzzles are helpful too, little activity pads. Right. New toys are a great way of keeping their attention. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be brand new. It could just be a toy you've hidden a couple of months back that they've forgotten about, and you can reintroduce it to them on this trip. Right. And one thing that Sunri did that was really great on that Europe trip was she colored a day bag. So it was like just one of those drawstring day bags, and she colored it with, um, she made like uh, road tracks on it. So we laid it out on the airplane desk, fold down desk, and he played with it for hours, you know, it became played on his the roads. Car road. Right. Yeah. So, and we could store all the cars in that day bag then for him. So it was a, it was a good thing. Right. Um, so another tip that we want to share is audiobooks for kids, especially in the car. This has been, you know, so transformative. Uh, you know, we read these children books all the time to these kids, but you can actually have pre-recorded audiobooks. Um, you know, go to the library, you can get the audiobooks, uh, this like read aloud type books and just download the MP3 onto your phone. And you can play that on long trips. So we do that all the time. Also, another great tip is to go on YouTube where they have these uh, read aloud channels. And you can go to like YouTube to MP3 converter on Google and just uh, download those YouTube files into MP3. And that's what I did. So now we have like 30, 40 books on both our iPhones. And we can just play that uh, to them on uh, at a whim from our car speakers. And they and love it. They love it. And I feel like it's very, you know, it gets their imagination going, picturing all the things that are being read aloud to them. And it's a great way to entertain them. And it stops all the questions. Oh, are we there yet? Can yeah. we get out? I want to stretch. <laughs> so I think that's it for the tips we got for you guys. I hope this has been helpful. I hope that this has been motivating and inspirational for you to take your own extended family trips out on, you know, to explore the wonderful destinations all around us. Don't be afraid to travel with your kids. They love it. You'll love it. The younger you start, the younger they'll be excited for it and more used to it right and start start with little baby steps you know do a trip to a local state park or you know the closest national campground and then go from there start building up and go on an international adventure to thailand or something <laughs> 
So hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, be sure to subscribe, to like, to leave us a re- rating and review on iTunes. That would really help. Uh, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Next time on the FanVestor podcast, we are talking crunchy parenting ideas. And we're going to start with barefoot running, my story there, natural family planning, hypnobirthing, and homeschooling. Very odd things, I know, but it'll all collectively congeal into something wonderful. Congeal, that was a good word, right? (laughs) Um, So definitely tune in to episode seven coming up next week. So hope to catch you there. Have a good one. Godspeed.